Good afternoon, everybody. So, good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Shalini Sharma, the founder of Global Institute for Circular Economy and SDGs. Welcome you on the second day of the web conference on circular economy and sustainable development goals, strategy 2020 and 2030. I welcome all the speakers and the participants to join us for this web conference for next two hours. For the want of bandwidth, we will keep our cameras closed for a while and come back during the planning discussion. In the meantime, you will listen from all the speakers uh, as on agenda. So uh, we organized this uh, two days web conference. This is the second day. On the first day, we learned from uh, United Nations, GIZ, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Gujarat Cleaner Production Center, Tata Group Companies, Tata Chemicals, and Mahindra Group's Sustainability Initiatives. In today's session, we will listen to biodiversity and circular economy. We will learn about industry and circular economy, policy, recycling associations point of view, and fiscal instruments as well as on water pollution prevention through the change in human behavior. So just to share some basic information, we will share these videos on the YouTube channel of the Institute. The channel is named as Sustain. You may subscribe on YouTube to see the videos later at any point of time. Format of this web conference for two hours will be that around 10 to 15 minutes of presentation by each speaker and we will have quick question and answer during the panel discussion in the last 15 minutes of the web conference. To post the questions, you may write in question and answer box that is given on the right side of your screen. And uh, we will take the questions if relevant to the speakers on the dials. Just quickly to introduce you with the organizers. This web conference is organized by Institute for Circular Economy and SDGs, an NGO that is registered with Darpan Niti Ayo, Government of India. And another partner is Sanshodhan and E-Waste Exchange, a private limited company working on implementation of e-waste management rules and partnered with few state governments, assisting the implementation of e-waste management policies for governments and industries. We are here for next two hours together. So network with each other by sending the messages or the contact details if you would like to and contribute to SDG 17, that is partnership for goals. These two hours should be meaningful for you and for all of us. So let's start the presentations. As we all know, circular economy is a traditional practice in India. The world find this concept quite captivating now and of course, resource crisis, the need of resources, resource recovery, climate change, industry 4.0, and ambition of the countries to develop and grow need circular economic concepts on the ground. Let's move to our first speaker, Mr. Sujay Banerjee. Mr. Sujay Banerjee is an Indian Forest Service officer, currently the chief conservator of the forest, posted in Uttar Pradesh. He is a multi-talented personality. Apart from being an expert on forest biodiversity and related day-to-day -day activities related to the forest on the ground, he works on the lot of things that related to poaching, forest degradation, etc. He is a tiger, snakes, and other wildlife savior. He is an avid tracker, a researcher having various publications at international levels. He is a very good singer and you can listen to him on the YouTube. He plays mouth organ, guitar and sing at the same time. I welcome Mr. Sujay Banerjee to share his presentation on the today's topic, circular economy and biodiversity. Over to you, Sujay. I'm inviting him on the stage. Uh, it will take a moment to share his screen. Over to you, Sujay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh... It is a pleasure to meet you all virtually. These are very different times. And uh, certainly all of us are in strange situations. 
but again this is a good opportunity for all of us to bring out the best among us so uh let me start my presentation uh would you like to share the screen yeah uh, just uh should i share your entire screen or the application window let me see your application window okay think entire screen after opening the presentation entire screen so this is my presentation uh, for the talk today and uh, it's about biodiversity and economy and uh, very briefly i'll be touching some aspects of how the biodiversity is important uh, from the economic point of view uh, this uh, talk would be roughly around 10 minutes and uh, i had structured it in a way that if there are any questions uh, regarding this presentation right now i think there are some people attending also um, so if they have any questions maybe they can write it in the chat and maybe yeah. i could answer them yeah now coming to the economics of biodiversity we have uh, two you know measures of uh, biodiversity the first is the direct use value which can be quantified in monetary terms obviously it means the benefit that is actually translating in monetary terms into monetary terms and we have the indirect use values uh, of the biodiversity say for example agar hum uh, if we talk about uh, say our crop security so uh, in the case of say for example uh, rice if we lose the biodiversity of the various varieties of rice the various cultivars of rice then in the future we might not have a uh, good quality rice you know we don't have much genetic material to improve upon it and other productivity of our rice for example goes down the other thing is uh, in the entire ecosystem we have different kinds of uh, organisms and pollinators and birds and bees and all of them though no matter how small or how large they are each and every organism in nature has a very unique role to play and in case they are removed then there is a problem say for example to give you one or two examples one is about we are seeing the locust problem that is happening in the country and like some of the experts might say it's a population explosion it's a one time occurrence and uh, it is a a, a a a repetitive phenomenon happening every 5 years 7 years whatever but the fact is that the bird diversity the the birds who are actually feeding on these locust their numbers have gone down their populations have come down and no matter Uh, and this is the reason why the locusts get to multiply the other example that i can give you is with the uh, dwindling number of leopard or other predators in the forest the monkey the the red faced monkey they, they are called rhesus macaque so they are increasing and uh, you see them in, in almost all the cities of the country largely all across the country the monkey menace is growing and growing and growing so in terms of direct use values if we talk in the global context the global economic value of forest ec ecosystem goods and services of the forest like i am talking here only about the forest because that is something uh, which gives tangible outputs in the form of timber and uh, uh, you know other things that can actually be measured economically in uh, monetary terms and the global economic value of the forest ecosystem goods and services of the forest is estimated at 4.7 trillion annually now this includes the the goods and services also you know not just the the tangible ones also but this value also includes the goods and services of the forest as well and there are if we look at the indirect use values then the most comprehensive global estimate suggests that ecosystem services provide benefits of us dollar 125 to 140 trillion us dollar per year which is more than one and a half times the size of the global GDP. in other words the indirect use values of the biodiversity is one and a half times of all the gdps of all the countries combined one and a half times so you can see how important the uh, global biodiversity is at the moment now there are uh, certain issues that uh, concern the biodiversity and we need to address these issues so first of all the biggest loss as uh, the biggest threat that is uh, there today is that biodiversity loss is among the top global risks to society so if uh, 
we are losing biodiversity at a very high rate and we don't even know it and as i said earlier about the like, example about the rice thing in case we are losing our genetical our genetic diversity then uh, we are at at great great loss and we are putting our future into the risk am i audible hello hello am i audible yes you are audible thanks thanks sometimes there was disturbance in between but i think they are okay now uh, studies have proved that the natural forest have declined by 6.5 million now this is a time frame of uh, a large uh, you know time period it's from the it's from 75 to the present so over a period of some 20 30 uh, so period of some 30 40 years we have lost 6.5 uh, million uh, hectares i'm sorry hectares per year between 2010 and 2015 in other words but in this 5 uh, year time period we have lost an area larger than the united kingdom this is speaking in terms of uh, the global the entire world the scenario is that we have in 5 years we have lost an area larger than the united kingdom the natural wetlands have declined by 35% between 1970 and 2015 this is a time period of 45 years so our wetlands are gradually going away we are losing them and uh, 35% of the global wetlands we have lost in exactly 45 years and uh, you all of you would have heard about the coral colonies the coral ecosystems that exist in shallow waters so john i think we lost your screen uh is it shall i watch uh, what uh, you uh, you lo- we lost your screen share can you screen share once again yeah i'll I, i'll do that check back again uh is it visible now uh not yet yeah it's coming up now yeah yeah it's good now good enough so as yeah. as i said uh, the natural forest declined by 6.5 million hectare in 5 years and the natural wetlands declined by 35% between 1970 and 2015 that is a 45 year period and we were talking about the coral so the coral uh, ecosystems you would have heard they are very productive ecosystem very important uh, for fish farming or especially people who are uh, into fishing the fishing industry so 30% of the corals are now at the risk from bleaching you would have heard about uh, corals being bleached and gradually dying off and uh, local extinction of 60% of vertebrate population so for instance the asiatic cheetahs were found in india before but like uh... hello hello am i audible hello yeah audible now yeah, yeah. but the screen is gone yeah screen is gone again is it yeah uh let me let me try again air meter is it visible now uh, it takes few seconds yeah it's coming up yes hello uh, is is it there there is a screen uh, can you see the screen now uh, screen off again uh, screen is not no. sharing shall i continue uh how do i do it are are the others uh, they can they see my screen uh they can see uh, your pic but they are unable to see the screen uh so try sharing once again otherwise we can go ah uh, because uh, it says that the google chrome is not responding there is some problem mm-hmm. nevertheless i i'll i'll go on with the presentation till this problem is over yeah and uh, 60% of the vertebrate populations have disappeared since 1970 so which means the local extinction of 60% of the vertebrate population uh do i log out and and come again because it seems the system has hung uh okay 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 yeah uh, try to refresh it from the top there is a refresh button so try to refresh your screen again uh 
Uh, now? Uh, yes, you are back. And try to share the screen once. Now? Your voice is not clear. Now? Uh, screen is coming up. Your voice is not clear. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, cool. okay. Now let's look at uh, what is the way forward and how we can address the issue. The first thing is about a global biodiversity framework, uh, which is about effective international action to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. In other words, the different countries of the world, they come together and form a global biodiversity framework. A lot of work has already been done, and I'm sure some of you might also be aware about it. So a lot of work has already been done about the global diversity framework, uh, biodiversity framework in uh, across the countries. Now, there are certain policy instruments that can be used for biodiversity. Say, for example, if we look at uh, the petrol pricing in Delhi, then a certain uh, amount of cess is being charged. Like you, every liter that you're putting into your vehicle, you are paying a certain amount of money as environmental cess. So that uh, money that goes to environmental cess is supposed to be pumped back for environment. So simply we can have some kind of policy instrument for the biodiversity to, you know, kind of uh, ameliorate or help the issues concerning biodiversity. And uh, this is the most important thing because the kind of finance that is required for uh, mitigating the biodiversity loss is quite uh, magnanimous. And therefore, we have to scale up and align finance for biodiversity from all sources. And this also means that different countries have to pool in their resources. And uh, some countries who are not biodiverse rich, they need to actually pay for uh, other third world countries, uh, including India, to save their biodiversity. So basically, it's, it's uh, global financing for uh, saving the local biodiversity. Now, uh, th there are certain subsidies which are harmful to biodiversity. And uh, subsidies also includes policies. So these uh, policies or subsidies which are harmful to biodiversity need to be identified and uh, some uh, kind of corrective measure has to be taken at the policy level. And there needs to be string stringent check on development projects in biodiversity areas. So many areas you would be especially reading about uh, some mining projects coming in Assam and Arunachal Pradesh and hydroelectric projects in the Northeast and uh, in Chhattisgarh, uh, some mines are coming up in very dense forests. So we need to have some kind of policy, not just in India, but globally, where uh, we say that like this area is biodiversity rich and it's an absolutely no go area for any kind of developmental activities. And uh, though we have so much of biodiversity, we unfortunately do not have much of uh, the the studies to document the value of the biodiversity and the impacts of the businesses and financial organization if for example somebody is uh, running an industry in near to mangrove forest and the water is polluting the effluents are polluting the mangrove ecosystem so we do need to understand the impacts and there are like more like uh, you know, release of uh, toxic gases or obnoxious gases into the atmosphere or even for other kind of uh, industries, uh, they have carbon footprints all across, uh, you know, and some have large carbon footprints, some have uh, lesser carbon footprints. And I would like to end my presentation by saying that if you really think the environment is less important than economy, then try holding your breath while you talk. Sujay, we are losing your voice. Uh, is, uh, is, can you see the slide? Can you see the slide? Yeah, yeah, you can see the slide and now voice is clear. Yeah, it says that uh, if you really think the environment is less important than economy, try holding your breath while you count your money. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are moving ahead with the next speaker I think it's a wonderful presentation and the and the strategies that are suggested are very useful and uh, I think people already started posting the questions about EIA and EMP which you addressed 
uh, just a minute back. So thank you. It was wonderful listening to you and your experience on the ground and learn from your deep understanding of interconnected issues on the climate, circularity and biodiversity. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, currently we are facing some issue with uh, uh, calling our uh, next speaker on the dais, Mr. Rajesh Sharma from Hero Mutakov. So in the meantime, when we are solving this issue, we will move to our third speaker, uh, Commodore Sujit Samadar. Uh, so, uh, we experience the environment and sustainability challenges get amplified when reached to the government because significant investment and efforts are made by the government departments to manage the natural resources like land, air and water for the sustenance of business and society and of course the waste that gets generated every hour in thousands of concrete jungles throughout the planet. I welcome our next speaker, Commodore Sujit Samatar, former consultant, former consultant, Niti Ayo, Government of India, who led development of various policies and projects at Niti Ayo. And he is advisor of various large associations like MRAI, strategic advisor for aerospace and DEF at FITI. And he's also the secretary of Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defense, Defense Studies. We know Commodore Sumit, Sujit Samatar when the office of CEO of Niti Aayog Government of India advised us to connect with him. It was around three to four years back and thereon along with him, we from Sanshodhan and e-waste exchange developed a model that is named as National Resource Recycling Platform, NRRP for India and submitted this model to Niti Aayog in 2018. Not only we developed this model along with him, but we implemented, start implementing, we started implementing it with the e-waste management, currently operating as e-wasteexchange.com. That is a digital infrastructure, present pan India, and having a physical presence in around 45 cities for online aggregation of e-waste. I call upon Commodore Sujit Samadar to share about the material recycling policy of India. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction and uh, I really recall our association from Niti Aayog days when we worked together to uh, try and bring material recycling and resource circularity to the center stage of uh, India's economic growth and developmental model. Um, so with that words, I would like to make a short presentation uh, on, uh, on um, I think it's the entire screen or it's the application window, yeah. So, uh, as you can now see uh, my screen, I think my presentation is you yeah. know, the case for National Material Recycling Policy and the need for a Circular Economy Act. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, yeah. I, I guess you can all see this, right? Yeah, full screen mode you can. I don't know? Yes, okay. it's good to go. Okay, right. So, you know, uh, the basic uh, thrust towards recycling and all has only started very recently, if I must say. So, for a long time, we had the Environment Protection Act, various sorts of rules and procedures and guidelines. But it is uh, around 2014, 15, 16, actually 2016 onwards, when this became center stage, when some directions at the highest level were issued to the government from the Honorable Prime Minister. Where the key issue of twin uh, challenges of waste management on the one side as well as sustainable development were brought to the same table. So today I'll speak about uh, my presentations on this form as you can see here, uh, some little background, we'll talk about the policy, we'll talk about the authority, what we need to do and what we need to conclude with. Now globally I think all this has been discussed uh, in yesterday's session but I just want to flag two points, our population is going to be 9.8 billion and more importantly 3 billion new middle class members will come in. So, which means uh, that's a hell of a load on Mother Earth. Material demand will rise from 86 billion tons to 185 billion metric tons. And I think this is an extremely conservative estimate. It will probably be closer to one and a half times that figure by 2050. But uh, I think countries have now woke up to this fact and they are now looking at uh, reconciliation between the economy and environment. And there are lots of uh, activities that are taking place. The EU has developed a circular economic action plan. There's a British standard on uh, for sea industries. There's a South, uh, South Korean initiative on circular act. 
many things are happening across the world. But uh, essentially, the circular economy is more closely linked with resource circularity. And from the proceedings that were ongoing yesterday, I want to highlight it is no longer about resource efficiency, which is a 1990s, early 2000 uh, sort of approach, but it is about resource circularity. That means you should be able to convert a tire back into a tire, a Coke bottle back into a Coke bottle, not just be efficient, you have to be circular. And on the other hand, sustainable development is not just about uh, environment. It requires at a political level, citizen participation, at the economic level, you need resource circularity, create value and eliminate waste. At social levels, we have to find inclusiveness and livelihood opportunities for people. At the industrial level, we need to look at how industry 4.0 uh, uh, concepts can be applied to uh, material recycling and reuse and remanufacturing operations. At technology level, what are the best possible available technologies that can reduce energy and material requirements? At the administrative level, how do we reward recycling and reuse and penalize waste? At the environment level, how do we protect our air, water, earth from hazardous waste? These are all things that requires a larger, um, um, let us say, view than a very narrow view of uh, environment alone. So when you look at the circular economy and the SDGs, I put them in, in, in a sequence in which I thought looks good and uh, can be explained. At the center of the entire SDG, in my view, is SDG 3, which is good health and well-being. I think in today's time, I, nobody can disagree with this. We just want good health and well-being. But we can't get good health and well-being unless we have uh, strong institutions of peace, justice and, and, uh, and institutions on one side. And there are also partnerships for the goals developed on the other side. Once we have these two things and once we get to good health and well-being, then responsible consumption, climate action, decent work, all of that will follow naturally. But uh, now when you look at, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes. We can hear. I can hear some other people speaking. So I think somebody's phone is uh, mic is off on or something. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, a map that we have created out of looking at all the fourteen sort of initiatives that that has been done across the world, and we see India has got only four tick marks, whereas Finland, Japan, uh, Austria. Uh, Denmark have got many more tick marks against the various oh. interventions that is required for uh, for moving towards a circular economy and, and sustainable development. Uh, as far as the Indian scene is concerned, we are already the second largest importer of scrap. We have huge deficits uh, by 2021. I'm, I'm sure my friends from the MRAI will bring these into more detail. We are also looking at our huge number of, uh, uh, of waste quantities that will be generated if you continue on a business as usual scenario. So what has been India's reaction to it? We created the Environment Protection Act in 1986, which was required in 1986. But today, waste is no longer something which is only a burden on Earth. It is now a resource. And I think that transformation needs to take place. Therefore, we have seen the original list of rules and uh, and uh, and interventions with the Ministry of Environment uh, and Climate Change produced were oriented solely towards environment, environment, environment. When you saw the steel scrap policy, the ship recycling policy, and the draft automotive recycling policy made by the Ministry of Steel in one case, Ministry of Shipping, and the Ministry of Road Transport, it took a huge departure from the standard story of environment. It looked at livelihoods, it looked at jobs, it looked at uh, better uh, resource circularity, it looked at the administrative arrangements, it looked at taxation, it looked at incentives. It was beautiful policies which uh, looked at it. So that is a transformation that the steel scrap policy, ship recycling policy, the draft automotive recycling policy has uh, taken departure from the erstwhile uh, purely environmental uh, point of view that was going on. So the key drop was uh, waste disposal, environment concern was the central focus. It did not look at the rest of it. It completely forgot about the sociological and societal transformation of the recycling workforce and how do we bring them into the community. It marginally touched on information, awareness, and communications for community participation, very marginally. It did not view this as a potential industry. It did not organize itself as a workforce. And mostly it was impractical and unimplementable. I don't want to talk too much about it. The latest uh, EPR guidelines for plastics is a is a laughable document. So I mean that is the sort of stuff that has been going on. So we need to figure out better ways of organizing our uh, waste into a resource and and uh, some benefits. So this is the standard thing. I'm saying 
I want to show you these pictures because this is also India. These are photographs which have been taken by me personally when I went and visited almost uh, 28 recycling units across India. There's an input, there's a process. This is the output. How beautifully stacked up there. This is what happens to paper. But what is the ground reality? This is also a reality. This is also reality. These photographs have been taken by me. This is also reality. So there is a disconnect between what we are saying. When you look at CND recycling waste, we are at 5%. Singapore does 100% recycling. But the record may be dismal, dis dismal, but there is huge headspace for growth. And there is huge headspace for entrepreneurs and businessmen to tap this opportunity to uh, make them into viable, sustainable okay. businesses. Then uh, this is the output that you get from recycling uh, uh, CND waste. All of it is value. 300 rupees a ton is what you, the profit that you can make per ton of recycling. And I see so much of it in Delhi, Sarojini Nagar, Naroji Nagar, all of those buildings have been broken down and all this material is going into some land. It's a sad story. Uh, similarly, the story for uh, uh, electronic waste, I think we spoke about it in the beginning also. It's a 60 billion euro opportunity and we really need to tap it. We're the third largest producer of uh, electronic waste, but we don't have systems in place to, uh, to recover rare earths from it, gold and silver from it, the PGM metals from it. We have to develop all these things and that requires technology and that technology will not come through the Environment Protection Act. It requires some other sort of intervention. When you look at the reality check on also on what the current national recycling rates are against global benchmarks, 40% for steel, 30% for aluminium. This is not a nice story. Let we, we, we have done well. I know PET we do well. Paper is dismal at 27%. I'm sure Amal will bring out many more statistics here when he's uh, making his presentation. So on ground, these are the stories, the key obstacles to realizing the opportunity. We don't understand the scrap material supply because the supply chain is sort of loose. We don't have sustained implementation methods. We have huge amount of import barriers, which, uh, which does not permit the Indian material recycling industry to scale up to global levels, like China has been able to do. We need to have standardization on recycled products. So there has to be more awareness on material recycling, and we need specific training and skill sets. This slide captures in a way how the material flows and how the money flows. As you can see here, this is how the material flows. We have the scrap pickers, the uh, collection yard, the aggregators, the distributor, and finally the recycler, and the money goes back here. But when you look at the money flow, you'll be shocked to hear that this poor rag picker gets one buck, but the manufacturer pays six rupees for the same piece. Of course, there's a lot of logistics, a lot of administration and all, but the multiplier is huge at six rupees. And most of this is not taxed. There's no tax here, there's no GST here, there's no GST here, there's no GST here. There may be some GST here and there's an input tax credit. So in this whole line, the government is also not only losing revenues, it is also having a lot of inefficiencies in the way it is done. And there's a lot of exploitation of labor. Now here, this is a very clear thing. After doing numerous site visits with the uh, MRAI and doing my time at Niti Ayo, to I don't know how many places we managed to see, very clearly, it was unorganized, it exploited employees, it was hazardous to the environment, and it was economically wasteful. And at the end of it, we learned one thing, that unless we have a national material recycling policy and an implementing agency for, uh, for that policy, things are going to be business as usual, and we are going to be just stuck where we are. So, uh, so an approach to a material recycling process was on three things. We need to reform how India will collect, segregate, hold, or sort, and process end of life products, reduce waste, and maximize recovery. Perform responsible material recycling to global standards. Everybody, whether it's the formal sector, informal sector, that sector, this sector, doesn't matter. Everybody has to do responsible material recycling. And the country as a whole has to move clear steps from linear to a circular economy. And all this will fully realize the latent social, economic, and environment values of this waste that we have. When you look at the missions, I said, look, some, first of all, we need to scale up. The whole model has to be socially in inclusive. It must be environmentally sustainable. It must use the best available technologies. We must have clear directions, less to landfills and incinerators, and reduce the landfill levels to at least 2015 or 2012 levels over a period of time. Become a zero waste society. System for waste and scrap collections has to be there and must look at all the scarce natural resources and stop mining to the extent possible.
so we have set some objectives recycling rates we have lots of headways there lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs and businessmen to uh, get into the business of recycling to uh, achieve the recycling rates as per global standards we must create mega recycling zones as um, as, um, as amar has visited china and many other places they do almost hundreds and thousands of tons 100 million tons of uh, processing is done in every recycling zone the jobs for 13 to 18 million people there are 10 lakh crores worth of value addition can be done we can meet the sdg goals and it's a hell of a lot of work that we can do socially for participation of citizens and the socio economic integration of the informal workers so when you look at it on a more segmental basis some targets have been set here this is on the slide on plastics container glass paper metal construction and demolition waste tires so all of these policies will have to have objectives and these objectives from here will come to the policy prescriptions as to how do we do it adopt the circular economy as specific goals and responsibilities to various stakeholders that means what the central government will do what state government will do what uh, recyclers will do what aggregators will do what the cpcb will do what urban local bodies will do we should know clearly ki kiska kya role kahan pe hai kiska that should be very clear at the moment everything is diffuse everybody is doing everybody else's job and consequently we are just floundering around we need to also upscale our material recycling industry to global standard that means a lot of technology and processes have to come in we need to really aggregate our waste pickers i see them every day in fact i have walked with my waste pickers uh, to see how this actual work takes and that was a great experience it took me a day of walking behind that cart but i understood how the system works so i like to be hands on it was really nice to do that and we need to see the circumstances in which this informal workforce works we need to provide them protection we need to give them assurance and security so that they become better we cannot have this informal workshop from generation after generation still living in poverty and and in bad so this is not correct we have to self help them and that requires an institutional framework we spoke about a re- uh, recycling exchange and we also need to have a good reverse logistics change today the, the one of the key challenges for material recycling is the huge logistics cost So some other policy prescriptions are here. We must extend the EPR to other products. We must have world-class mega recycling zones, local material collection. We have public procurement of recycled products. One of the areas which needs urgent intervention in terms of uh, public procurement is in the paper industry. I can't imagine why should uh, 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 CBAC board papers and answer books be not made out of recycled uh, product, but by rule they are disallowed. we must have authorized recyclers and traders we must introduce differential gst and custom duties create an mri have establishment recycling offices the government has to take the first step in all government organization there has to be a designated officer whose main job is to ensure responsible recycling and introduce it in the academic constitutions when you look at this policy and its potential we have done some major calculations here uh, and i have showed showed you the uh, big numbers there but but this slide tells you that there is a substantial amount of work which has been done behind making this uh, policy impact summary is we can release 700 to 750 million metric tons of end of life waste and scrap material we can add 3 million direct jobs we can add 12 to 15 million jobs in other sectors and we can create thousands of startups and entrepreneurs bring 10000 billion rupees into the economy and work towards achieving the sdg 12 so what do we need to do then we need to have an authority somebody with a danda india can only understand lathi and danda so what for so we need an nmra who will do this he will implement the national material recycling policy he will draft the national circular economy act he will review national uh, material recycling measures he will have a nationwide material recycling plan and programs create them look at the registration framework for scrap distributors scrap recyclers and make it uniform across all states states talk to uh, stakeholders to uh, to always continue to continuous improve you know uh, you have to have continuous improvement in whatever we set up it's not that you make it once and you sort of leave it there then what will it do it will also look at um, um, conflict resolution between departments and agencies everybody has got his own agenda mofcc has got a different agenda ministry of commerce and industry has got some third agenda ministry of finance has got some fourth agenda everybody has got some different agenda so unless they all work together as as one unit we will never be able to get this right so this is one of the primary duties other duties are on the slide which you may have seen the creation of various data etc 
then there are some other functions according to a lot of details on documentation certification inspections mediation uh, looking at uh, strengthening agreements and conventions these are all sorts of things that the nmra will do after having a a body of people of professionals who can do this some organizations organization structure will also be it the next thing that we need is uh, that has to be the nmra has to be in turn supported by a national institute of material recycling who should be the apex research body on material recycling in india it should talk about technical and economic research it should look at revenues for technology transfer skilling programs certification degree courses the whole skilling business of uh, making smart recycling in india bring in software into it bring in systems into it all of that is to be done by the nm nimr who will be placed under the nmra Uh, the recycling exchange is already started to a large extent, and we have seen this. I will not uh, spend time on it. I think she has already spoken about it, so I leave it there. And finally, we also need huge recycling zones. Um, you know, there are lots of barren lands which is lying in this in, uh, in this country. We need to transform those barren lands. And for heaven's sake, don't use forest land to do all this. Don't use agricultural land to do this. We got enough jaga of uh, waste land. Which we can convert into paradise by making material recycling zones there, integrated material recycling zones. So, and also finally, we need a circular economy act. Why? Why do you need a circular economy act, and why is the environment uh, protection act not sufficient? Because of all the reasons I mentioned earlier. There's political intervention, economic, social, industrial, techno, administrative, environmental. Maybe five other things also, which I, I may have missed out. But we need a circular economy act, something under which action can be taken on people like under the environment to protection act the government has the um, power of punishment and reward but we don't have a power of punishment and reward or for uh, review or whatever else under a circular economy act. we need to have that so this is a job that the nm r r a must do when it is formed up so uh, so the choice is very clear we have to move from linear to circular you need to manage it strategically if you don't manage it strategically we will blunder our way through sustainable development goals they are completely unachievable believe me and good health and well being will be impacted for generations of man we are already seeing this informal does not mean that the sector can operate outside the regulatory and compliance framework in disregard of human rights and labor laws in disregard of environment social and economic requirements and cause harm to civil society i do not buy this agreement that just because they are poor that because they are uneducated or abc they have a right to screw up the environment or screw up the uh, or flout laws that is completely unacceptable as far as i am concerned we need to strengthen that framework and make sure that this informal labor force joins the mainstream of of indian um, india's growth story and their um, uh, up, uh, their uh, let's say the children and all have a much better life ahead of them so but so they either either become responsible recyclers or they have to shut down i'm sorry that is a brutal choice but i do not go along with the view that the informal uh, sector should be you know sort of allowed to go on concurrently i think that has to stop as long as they are compliant we can accept so then in summary circular economy is uh, such required for sustainable development it's a necessary requirement of the circular economy it must balance the broader economic and social challenges while protecting environmental resources recycling in india is mostly on on formal we spoke about all of that has ordered the work the present policy of having one one separate uh, policy for one for tire one for battery one for e-waste one for cnd waste one for you know watches somebody else will have some new idea about some uh, more detailing that's a cockeyed stupid way of making policies the country needs one material recycling policy which should be integrated holistic and harmonized it should bring in all stakeholders onto one plane we should have clear roles and responsibilities to who is going to do what and how will it be implemented the other thing that i see wrong in many of the things that the government sometimes does is that they make a strategy before making a policy the most important thing as a military man i can tell you a strategy is a statement of ends ways and means agar hamara policy nahi hai to kis cheez ka strategy bana rahe the whole objective of strategy is to implement the policy or implement the objectives or realize the vision or meet the mission requirement that the policy has made we have gone and made some bloody strategy on what to achieve what first policy then the strategy and that is i think very important for us to do therefore our country needs a national material recycling policy all of you are listening to me all of you who are uh, 
concerned about our country in a positive way to save our mother earth to make sure our resources are done correctly a public movement has to be done to to get the national material recycling policy issued at the earliest because that is now no longer uh, a luxury it is an essential necessity for the sustainable growth of our country we have to put our shoulders to it and uh, make sure that national material recycling policy sees the light of day it is lying with the government for quite a long time they should they have had enough time to apply their minds to it and at some stage they need to issue the national material recycling policy with these uh, words let me thank you this slide i have stolen from flicker but fortunately i have uh, attributed it to flicker so i hope there is no uh, copyright infringements or some such thing but um, thank you very much for your patient hearing and i'm sure there there are any questions i'll be very happy to take them on at some uh, uh, stage when it is suitable thank you very much again and thank you again for the opportunity of sharing my views on this very important subject and compliments to you for having organized this uh, wonderful uh, uh, webinar thank you again thank you thank you so much for providing insight on the material in policy and its requirement and its importance it's indeed a requirement for the country to have an overarching policy as an enabler to strengthen the tech recycling ecosystem in india and uh, seems like participants are deeply involved now they are, we are getting so many messages about the wonderful presentation that you gave right away uh, request participants to keep sharing their questions questions and we will be taking up your questions during panel discussion before summarizing and before concluding this webinar uh, uh thank you sir uh, please uh, be with us for the panel discussion and uh, uh, after the present all the presentations we will be back for the panel discussion so thank i you. think i think unfortunately we will not be able to hear uh, from hero moto car uh, because uh, the speaker is in office and we are seeing some kind of a firewall or some issue uh so we are able to get him on the dais uh so we have speak we are now moving ahead to the uh next speaker uh mr sandeep bhattacharya uh mr sandeep bhattacharya is here with us yes uh moving ahead to our next speaker mr sandeep bhattacharya is an indian pro india project head for climate bonds an investor focused ngo from united kingdom mobilizing the debt capital markets for the climate solutions Climate bonds have some great innovative solutions for mobilizing debt capital as enabler for the climate solutions. His play he plays he play key role to enhance the relationships among various stakeholders, including banks and financial institutions, credit rating agencies, uh, uh, broker firms, consultancy firms, educational institutes, philanthropies, and corporates, and has been instrumental in development of green bond market in India. Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Over to you, Mr. Sandeep Patacharya. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, and thanks you are visible. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, you would like to share the screen? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, would you would you do that? You have this this thing, right? Oh yes. Oh yes. Just this. Uh, you can put the cameras off in case uh, you need a bandwidth, and then. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll just share this. Yeah. Uh, so we are having his presentation. We are sharing the screen on his behalf. Yeah. Uh, give me. Yes. So, are the slides visible? Uh, yes. Yeah. From from my side, it is. Uh, yeah, it's just now. yes, yeah. Uh, thank you, Shalini, for this opportunity. And today, I would just like to introduce you to our organization and how 
uh, what we are doing for uh, the environment generally through finance uh, and so we are we work towards link debt capital markets for causes now why why the debt capital markets uh, because it's the largest source of globally so close to trillion dollars is present in the debt capital markets uh, however it works in own manner it's a bit risk averse as a source of capital it's a bit risk but once you bring it in it can bring in a lot of capital into the, into the particular project so uh, what we do are a few things like you know policy advocacy so we have helped sebi come up with india green bond guidelines i'll just give some examples standard and certification so we certify green bonds so sbi state bank of india has done three green bonds with our certification uh, and renew power the ipp the india's largest ipp is currently doing its seventh green bond with our certification uh, and we do capacity building like you know this is one of the stuff of capacity building in terms of market intelligence we track every green bond in the world uh and our list of green bonds is often referred by uh, various financial institutions uh for evaluating their green portfolio uh, next slide please yeah uh, now before we go too much let's understand you know the basics of what is a bond uh, a bond if you go to the to the diagram below the initial part of a project is high risk project finance uh, which is bank loans or equity and once you know the timeline has elapsed and the assets are mature which is in the second part on the on the right hand side then you know it refinances into a bond that is generally the case though there i have dealt with bonds which are project finance bonds as well it generally requires some kinds of enhance somebody coming up with a project implementation guarantee uh, and there are things written there like it could be in many currencies most to green bonds out of india are offshore and are in foreign currency uh next slide please yeah so what are green bonds well, so that was a bond but what are green bonds green bonds are basically instruments it's a bond where there's an additional cat the proceeds can for green causes only uh it can be any entity and it does not necessarily mean that the entity is completely green so the national thermal power corporation has issued green bond which we have certified and it was the main uh, issuer national thermal power corporation solar and wind assets therefore it was eligible uh for a green bond doesn't matter if percent or even 90% of national thermal power corporation is actually thermal please yeah and green bond growing a fair bit i mean i think the sir slides can be circulated and people can go through the exact for uh, their reference next slide please in india uh, it's 2015 with exim bank you can see there has been some ups and downs a lot of government backed institutions did bond issuances 2018 was only one institution which is sbi it was a bad year because india bonds it was a bad year for indian bonds uh, 2019 pick up and 2020 is uh, showing good signs but with the international markets not doing well uh it is still well figures still now are a bit low and that might be the case globally the next slide please yeah so while uh, uh things are not happening that well this year uh, there are reasons why green bonds are advantages and you can see exim bank and state bank of india uh both stating the advantage and the fact that if they were able to get a slightly cheaper cost or a competitive cost uh, uh in you know these are both uh very conservative institutions and if they are thing like this well there must be something behind it is of course something which i was saying 
Next slide, please. Next slide. Is it okay now? Rotation? Uh, no, there was one more testimonial. No? Testimonial from Frederick's in India? Yeah, there's, there's one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not only India, Indian Railway Finance Corporation also. And you have the Republic of India. Uh, so, and somebody. America as well. So it's a global phenomena that the the green bond issuers have a good experience is a very good phenomena. Next slide, please. And you can see that it's been growing globally, but also in Asia. Though 2020, as you can expect, you know, is the numbers are not that great. I think he's a leader. I know it's not a nice thing to say, but it is so. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why does anybody issue green bonds? You can see most 98% of the issuers said that it attracted new investors. Now, you'll ask me, what is this new investors? Uh, the new investors are dedicated green funds. You know, there are funds who who will invest only green? There are plenty of such funds in Europe, uh, and that is the case. Uh, others things are you know enhanced visibility, cheaper pricing, contribution to strategy, higher demand. Uh, there is now a little bit of evidence that even if prices go high, if you if somebody issues a green bond. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So now, uh, how does a circular economy be enabled by green bonds? So we have come up with a waste management criteria. Uh, this is a very short presentation on what is covered and why. So and some of the issues that we faced in coming up with the criteria. It is not a detailed reference of uh, detailed explanation of the criteria because there's not sufficient time to do something like this in such a short presentation. You can always get in touch with me for if you know if you are interested. So uh, waste management through municipalities has been a significant portion of the green bond market and waste management accounts for around 5% of global emissions. So therefore we came up with a criteria for waste management. We are in touch with a few possible issuers in India who are in touch with us for you know issuance yeah next slide please yeah now selected municipal solid waste only uh, i heard the commodore's presentation there's a lot more waste going around construction demolition excavation and all that stuff uh, we didn't find enough robust data to come up with a standard uh, criteria for that. Uh, so we, our waste management criteria covers only municipal waste. Uh, and another thing which we didn't cover was pyrolysis and gasification followed by chemical recycling. We did discuss. We will possibly come up with it in another stage simply because you know we have resource constraints. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So this you know lays out for a technical person what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Uh, again, some some people can see you know the slides will be there for everyone. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So now here comes the list. Uh, I will not go into the detailed. Uh, what within all these things there are things co which qualify and which they don't qualify. The standard is available online, and I wouldn't get into such uh, great detail of all of these. But it's it's a good document to read, uh, and so all of these, you know, collection, waste storage, sorting, separation, recycling. There are norms about what what qualifies and what doesn't qualify. In what way you have to do, and what uh, so landfill. If you are not capturing eighty percent of the methane, it doesn't qualify. Uh, waste to energy is a bit of a controversy and I'll dwell on it separately. I know incineration is a bit of a controversy. And these are 
the mitigation check checklist but we also have an adaptation and resilience checklist which means will setting up the facility itself cause some issues uh, environmental issues that you know which which will accelerate the adaptation to climate change climate change has happened and we need to adapt to it so will setting up the facility itself create some issues so that's that's what we discuss next uh, sorry next slide please uh, yeah so the adaptation and checklist is here so is the site you know such uh risk and so so the asset or the site such that is there a climate related vulnerability is this going is the site going to be eroded due to the rising ocean or you know rising tide in some years uh will there be an impact in the larger context temporarily or specially i mean will the people around suffer because of the complex coming in for some reason you know project to project it's very different uh and has the issuer who is mobilizing the money uh, designed and implemented strategies to mitigate and adapt to these changes and vulnerabilities that is again something we need to look at yeah and the next slide please yeah so waste to energy is a bit controversial as i said uh and it's it's slightly what what is known as lower down in the waste hierarchy uh and uh, people told us that look you shouldn't have it in your criteria because uh there are greener ways of doing things and uh, therefore if you put it in your criteria then it will disincentivize the other greener ways of doing things like recycling uh but however uh the while we are aiming towards a circular economy uh we really can't have everything to be recycled uh so even with the countries with lots of resources which is the european union uh have not been able to recycle as commodores uh, this thing said it uh so we will need waste to energy uh so what we thought therefore was that uh so long as the emissions next slide please uh i think we don't have okay it. Okay, okay okay thank you thank you sorry so what we thought is in a, in a in our uh, criteria what we did was we uh recognize anything which goes the emission intensity of which is below that of the national grid in that case we recognize that particular facility uh thanks a lot uh for the opportunity to present and the opportunity to hear the other presenters i'm open to questions or hearing from the other presenters thank you thanks shalini uh thank you uh, mr sandeep bhattacharya thank you so much for providing insights on green bond uh, market significance and procedure uh, it's great to learn innovative dac instrument uh, promoting climate action on the ground thank you so much so we will call you again on the panel discussion uh let's move to our ne uh, next speaker uh but before that we will try to bring mr rajesh on the dais Uh, maybe if we can Mr. Rajesh can you hear us Mr Rajesh can you hear us no i think uh, we are unable to get him on the dais so we will be moving to our uh, next speaker in the meantime we are having miss shan lalwani the founder of coco gasso a company that produces sustainable household cleaning products she graduated from sony brook university and after gaining more than 10 years of experience she decided to set up her own venture uh, over to miss shan, shan lalwani hi am i audible yes yes yeah hi um i'll just start the screen share
um, in my everyday life, when the circular economy comes up, somehow it's always about. Sorry. Sorry, just one second. In my everyday life, when the circular economy comes up, somehow it's always about packaging. And it goes simply into the plastic of things. In more aware settings like this, we talk about a wider range of topics like e-waste, etc. It's mostly physical products. And very rarely do we talk about the intangible, such as chemical waste in our waterways. Even then, we are only talking about treating waste. And very rarely, even sequestering that waste for reuse. But at the heart of the circular economy lays the idea that designing for waste itself is a flawed system, that we need to go back and rethink design itself. Hi, I'm Shan. I'm the founder of Coco Custo of Laundry Detergents and a circular entrepreneur. Three years ago, I was diving off the coast of Mauritius and I was surrounded by these beautiful corals and tropical fish, but I couldn't really shake this feeling of dread. On the boat ride over to the dive site, the instructors had been talking about how runoff from cleaning chemicals had bleached a large chunk of the coral in the neighboring shallow bay. And the crown of thorn sea stars that fed off nutrient pollution were eating the ones that were left. On that 45 minute dive alone, my untrained eyes spotted eight of these sea stars. When I got back to my hotel room that evening, instead of enjoying my vacation, I spent half the night researching. Turns out, although linear alkyl benzene sulfonates were introduced as a biodegradable surfactant with a very short half-life, they are 100% fatal to coral polyps at a 5 part per million concentration. At lower concentrations, this obviously might be reduced. So after treatment or when the chemical finally does start breaking down, the effect isn't that bad. Then again, how can something derived from petrochemicals be circular? Even when it does finally break down into the basic components, we end up releasing carbon that used to be stored underground into the atmosphere. So I'd like to show you some pictures of coral now. While coral reefs cover only 1% of the ocean floor, they support 25% of all marine life. Believe it or not, all the pictures I showed you, including this one, were taken off our very own Mumbai coast. Even our murky waters can sustain some of these exotic species. But for how long? Here's a number I'm sure you'll believe. Mumbai alone dumps 21 million metric tons of untreated sewage into the sea every single day. Then there are other culprits like phosphates. This is the Bilander Lake that forms nearly every year and sometimes it even catches fire. It costs us 377 kilograms of CO2 to remove one kilogram of phosphorus from wastewater. Is that really a cost we are willing to bear? At minimum in India alone, with a measly 2.7 kg per capita detergent consumption, it ends up costing it will end up costing us 13.2 billion billion with a B tons of CO2 just to remove something we shouldn't be putting into the water anyways. Again, when we consider these problems, both health and environmental, we start to think about, okay, how do we go about treating this waste? But getting back to my point, why not reduce the amount of this waste to begin with? We need to rethink design or in commercial and engineering terms, rethink R&D instead of scrambling to find ways of dealing with the problem later. So what do we do about this? If you were like me, you will first try and change your own life. Back in 2015, when I found out that a once pristine beach I used to visit was covered in plastic, I started by cleaning it and then by trying to cut plastic out of my life. That's when I first learned about the circular economy. I tried to be a responsible consumer. Uh, you will, if you're like me, when you find out detergents are killing corals, you will try and find a detergent that doesn't or one that doesn't cause eutrophication of freshwater bodies. And when the only options you're presented with either come in plastic packaging or cost too much, 
or ask you to boil a berry from a Himalayan mountain range, you start to question your life choices. There are only a handful of people out there who are willing to go to those lengths and a handful of responsible consumers will not cause the kind of sea change we need in the coming years. The circular economy is hard to handle. It takes immense effort, self-control, and a complete disconnect from the way the modern world is built. I don't know about you, but when I worked in the corporate world, I spent a decade overworking. I didn't have free time to spend on trying to find a solution. Either way, it didn't exist. The onus lies on industry. While consumers are willing to change, they need options. So what is the way forward? I've said it before and I'll say it again. We need to rethink design. During lockdown, when most industrial activities stopped and our lives came to a grinding halt, we found out that our water bodies ended up cleaning themselves. No government initiative or community action was able to do in two decades what a simple lockdown did in a month. This Images of the Yamuna River just around the 25th of May, um, a month after lockdown. We even heard stories about dolphins swimming off Marine Drive and exotic birds, you know, on people's balconies. We saw bluer skies than we ever have before. In contrast, this is the Yamuna River last year. The way forward involves not just industrial innovation and infrastructural developments, because when one speaks about developments, we speak about them incrementally. Unfortunately, the world doesn't have that kind of time. When we look at game changers, we can think of companies like Tesla, who came out of left field and took the electric car out, out of the concept car shows and onto the road. Or Impossible Food, that created plant-based meats. Even when we look at zero waste or packet or package-free stores, it's always small businesses that presented the concept at first and then were copied by large brands, for example, like Waitrose in the UK. We need to complete erase everything on the drawing board and forget about the world and industry the way it is today. Yes, that is easier said than done. But time and time again, it has been proven that if one wants, one can change. Besides industry, legislation can change too. And again, incremental change isn't enough. Yes, minimum, phos mi mi minimum phosphate requirements in detergents have been reduced to 2.5% recently. On the other hand, how many times have we had plastic bans that have been immediately revoked? Instead of supporting the status quo, legislation needs to encourage innovation. Our government probably spends thousands of crores on cleaning up water bodies. When we look at the cost of building and running sewage and effluent treatment plants, installing booms in stormwater drains or delegating land to landfills, the, number really, the numbers really do add up. If instead we could somehow use these fiscal resources to encourage industries which create waste, which create waste that requires little to no treatment in both production and use. Maybe if, maybe then, if, all, if we all change our thinking and habits, including the habit of doing things the way we always have, we could create a world where we don't just have a couple of months of clean rivers and oceans, of blue skies and great air quality. It can be decades and lifetimes. Imagine that. Thank you. Um, so that was um, my plan forward. Thank you, Shalini, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and your wonderful organization. Thank you so much, Anne, for the wonderful presentation and your journey for saving the water body. Uh, yes, I think the load of detergents on water body systems. As an environment expert, I would like to see that the enhanced use of degradable products among the population at large. Thank you so much, Sean. So we'll bring you back once again uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, so uh, we have uh, no success yet uh, to bring them on the board. Uh, so we will be move, moving to the last, but not, not the least, uh, the speaker for today's session. Uh, we will move to Mr. Amar Singh. So in all the countries we can see, 
am I am I audible clearly? Shalini, your voice is breaking. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. So, uh, thank you. so thank you yeah. very much, Shalini. Uh, what a nice speech by Dr. Sam uh, Mr. Sujit Samadar, who is also an advisor to MRI and has a has worked along with MRI for on policies like end of vehicle policy, which was made by Ministry of Road Transport and Highway. Good afternoon, everyone. To start with, I would like to give a brief introduction about Material Recycling Association of India, which is the apex national association promoting the responsible recycling in India. We are having more than 1200 members out of which 250 members are foreign members, foreign companies. Uh, all these members comprises of around 20,000 units and these units are employing around 25 lakh people. MRIA started in 2011 for the first six years we worked only on the metal side but in 2018 or i can say mid of 2017 niti ayog and various ministries insisted that mria should include other recyclables under its uh, purview so we worked and uh, and comprised plastic paper e-waste and other recyclables in our segment now recycling industry is the link in a circular economy which reintroduces a resource into the production chain a united nation report estimates that by 2050 world population will reach 9.8 billion and about 3 billion more people will prosper to middle class consumption levels requiring 71 percent more resource capita than today in the same time According to the National Resource Panel report, the total minerals and material demand would rise from 86 to 185 billion metric tons. And to fulfill these, we can't just take our finite resources. We have to focus more and more on recycling and that too in responsible manner. Recycling in haphazard manner always pollute air, water, soil, and degrade the health of workers and on the other hand responsible recycling can result in reduction of PhD emission I, I mean to say greenhouse gases emissions and uh, dependence on non-renewable working materials I'll just give you a quick example that how much by recycling one ton of steel we save 74% of the energy, 40% less water consumption, and 58% reduction in CO2 emissions using steel scrap versus primary ore. Recycling one ton of aluminum scrap, 95% energy, saves 92% reduction in CO2 emissions. Recycling a single ton of paper saves 4,100 kilowatt of energy, 172 liters of oil approximately 32,000 liter of water and, an, and on average 17 trees while preventing the emissions of 27 kg of air pollutant. In India, we all are embarking on higher growth trajectories and our resource requirement will continue to increase multifold. Estimates suggest that annual material consumption in India will triple by 2030 compared to 4.83 billion metric ton in 2009. So as the consumption increases, India's commitment toward implementing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number 12, on sustainable consumption and production pattern, binds India to reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling and reuse by 2030 and through increasing national recycling rate of materials. India produces 62 million tons of municipal solid waste annually, which is likely to reach 165 metric ton by 2030 and 450 metric ton by 2045. But the systems to manage such waste is practically dysfunctional suffering from 
organized organizational inefficiencies distorted in incentives weak infrastructure sub optimal funding this is the biggest problem which our recycling industry in india is facing we don't have proper policies we don't have efficient uh, our our waste is going into unorganized sector the labor who are working the people who are working in recycling sector are not getting proper incentives and there is lack of support from government also in india the recycling rate are way below international benchmark mr samadar has already uh, covered this in his presentation but i'll just give a glimpse for packaging and paper it is merely 27% for plastic it is around 75 to 80% metal merely 30 to 35% and in the scandinavian countries the average recycling rate has reached almost 90% Indian recycling rates are declining due to a variety of reasons. First, there is neither a strong social awareness nor a enough political will to promote recycling as a way of life. Second, waste collection and segregation mechanism is largely unorganized, leading to scrap contamination. Third, most municipal infrastructure is outdated and inadequate in terms of collection transportation and last but not the least appropriate technologies to maximize recovery of recycling are still at the developing stage in india we are uh, around 40 million metric ton of ferrous scrap is available but we are we have a very huge shortfall of 8 million metric ton of steel which we have to import every year same as with aluminium total aluminium production in india is around 4.1 million metric ton out of which 1.3 million metric ton is produced through recycling route but very sorry to say that mo most of this precious metals are not available in india in good quality i can say so our industries are dependent upon imports total copper production in india is around 1 million ton and around 0.2 million ton is through recycling route in lead the major contributor is through recycling and in this we produce around 80 percent through recycling zinc in zinc we produce around 10 percent through recycling route and total production is around 70 lakh tons india generates around 15 million tons of paper annually of which 26 percent is recycled india generates around 26 uh, sorry uh, india generates around 2 million ton of electronic waste annually of which around in the organized sector i can say only five percent of e-waste is going india generates around 5.6 million ton of plastics annually of which 70 percent is recycled and one of the highest recycling percentage to promote the responsible recycling and to reduce our dependency on imports mra had worked with niti io on national material recycling policy in august uh, 2018 but till date the policy has not seen the light of the date and uh light of the day and mr samadar has just uh, emphasized that how important is, is that policy i'll just give you a brief and will focus on very important points that if this policy is implemented this year there will be huge increase in domestic dormant scrap creating massive job opportunities of more than 3 million direct and 10 to 15 million indirect new jobs by 2025 also a substantial increase in the gross value product in addition to the economy of around 10 10 billion rupees with enormous savings on dhg emissions energy consumptions and reduced landfills by unlocking the huge land bank for commercial purpose 
India will become energy surplus, water positive, and carbon neutral economy. Also, MRI is working along with various ministries, and we have learned that Ministry of Steel is coming up with steel scrap policy, Ministry of Mines is coming up with aluminium policy, non ferrous metals policy, then uh, Niti Aayog wants to come up with na national resource efficiency policy, uh, MOEF is planning to come up with uh, national resource efficiency policy, Niti Aayog is coming up with national material recycling policy, but why, why, I don't understand why so many policies are needed. We can only and only become more responsible if there is one policy which is emphasized by the government with least compliances and uh, regulations so that people can work in an efficient manner and in more responsible way. So I, my personal suggestion is to the government that we should not focus on too many policies rather than we should keep our mind on one policy and implement it at the earliest so that uh, our country get all the socio-economic benefits which are, which are attached with it. To sum up and increase the recycling in, in the country in a responsible manner, we should focus on increased public awareness by including recycling in the curriculum, increased social economic integration of the informal recycling workforce into the formal recycling economy, economy, increased use of recyclable content in manufacturing of final products, adoption of best international practices, huge investment in research and development of best technologies for maximum recovery of materials which goes in recycling, create systems and organization that would send less to landfills and incinerators and more and more to recyclers and reusers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Amar Singh. Thank you. And uh, uh, this this was the real scenario that is happening uh, at the uh, recycling uh, space. And I think yeah, it need a bigger boost, especially for the not only for the circular economy, but to meet the sustainable development goals. That are set to meet for set for uh, 2030. So thank you for providing these insights from the point of view of the association. So as we are uh, moving towards the end of this conference, web conference, uh, we have a lot of requests for providing summary that has happened in uh, yesterday and uh, today. Uh, so this is Dr. Sali Sharma. I'm coming uh, uh, for with a little brief for you. Uh, what has happened yesterday and uh, what has happened today. Uh, so first of all, uh, just a brief about my views on this. That why did our, why we did this conference and where it comes from. Uh, so in almost uh, in almost all the countries, we can easily spot that industrialization over production, increased purchasing capacity of society, and overconsumption lead to the linear economy, that is make, sell, and throw economy. Linear economy leads to the increasing size of dump yards, marine litter, climate change, ecological disturbances, and started posing a social, environmental, and financial challenges at various levels. And it's getting intense every year, and now started making impact on the very existence of mankind. This is the reason we set up this Institute for Circular Economy and SDGs as an NGO in June 2018. And we invite you all to join us by creating a revolution to meet Sustainable Development Goals 2030. And that's how we named this conference Circular Economy and its Sustainable Development Goals Strategy 2020-2030 during this decade of action. Uh, so uh, we will take a quick summary and then we will go to uh, question and answer. I'm taking you with the, uh, the journey that we took yesterday and today. Uh, during these two days of web conference on the topic 
uh, we had we provided some deep insights on the current status on the such subject and avenues ahead we learned from around seven seven speakers yesterday and six, five speakers today unfortunately we could not have hero motocorp with us we we planned them we scheduled them with us so total 12 speakers who shared their visions vision mission plan and strategies on the subject so we started with ms shabnam siddiqui from un global compact who shared about the efficacy of circular economy in new now then we moved to dr rashna arora from giz who shared about the draft national resource efficiency policy and how critical it is to have the involvement of various ministries to implement such cross sectional and cross functional policy then we learned on e waste management policy the technologies the status the issues in the sector we heard from dr sandeep chatterjee a scientist f from ministry of electronics and it there on we heard on circular cities and requirements over and above the technological mod technical models of circular economy where i shared about the importance of the leadership governance plan and design system standardization and industry 4.0 and the framework that have potential to to take the circular economy vision for implementation on ground implementation on ground for the for making the real city, circular cities for a better tomorrow there on we learned from dr bharat jain member secretary gujarat pollution control board about the initiatives taken in gujarat to enhance the cleaner production practices in small and medium scale industries then we heard from richard dr richard lobo from tata chemicals about the best practices in circular economy in chemical sector as well on the new product that is launched from tata chemicals and it is named as inspirico that is the world's first branded cobalt that's a rare metal very important and is used for the production of production of electro, electronic products then we learned about the circular economy practices at mahindra group and the way mahindra group is making waste out of well a wealth out of waste where they have they are having a savings of few crores per annum from their waste during panel discussion we heard a lot from this experts that that the very essence of current times is the survival empathy is the key financials will flow and upskilling upskilling is the requirement post covid new norms will be in place and we have to handle the environment techno and economy with care for the balanced growth and survival of living beings on the planet today we learn from mr sujoy banerji about the policies about the uh, biodiversity and circular economy interaction and the environment says that is being pulled and it need to be invested for the development of biodiversity uh, environmental to solve the environmental issues and also the focus on the subsidies that need to be identified and if the subsidies are harmful then that need to be eliminated next we could not listen from mr rajesh sharma from hero motor corp but in case we get to hear from him uh, making a video we will upload it on youtube sustain channel you will be able to hear him later uh, then we invited commodore uh, sujit samadar a very very uh, good sentence that we heard Uh, today whether comply for environment or shutdown this is very important informal doesn't mean that they cannot be formalized there should be the mechanism the process to bring the informal uh, channels into the formal streams and mainstream for the socio economic development of the country then we heard from mr sandeep patacharya about the about the fiscal instruments and how it is uh, growing in india and uh, then ms shan lalwani she was discussing about uh, the water con uh, saving the water preventing the water pollution that is happening because of the detergents and the phosphates and how an initiative can make a change on the ground then we uh, listen from mr amar singh about the contribution of the material resource recycling association and uh, the way it can make the change not really overburdening the recycling fraternity with the Uh, policies but rather to make a framework that can enable uh, uh, and enhance and strengthen the recycling ecosystem in the country so as we heard uh, to uh, aiding to mr amar singh i will as a as a member of recycling association i would also add that 15 days back we had a 
conversation with uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan, CEO of Niti Ayo, and Mr. Amar Singh, I think you would like to say something on this. That CEO Niti Ayo suggest uh, said that he is very positive on to strengthen the recycling ecosystem in country, and he would like to see that every smart city is having a recycling uh, uh, industry, recycling industry in every smart city. And uh, moreover, uh, DIP Ministry of Industry and Commerce will be given the responsibility uh, to look into the recycling activities for the country. So with this, uh, from Institute for Circular Economy and SDGs, and also on the behalf on behalf of Carbon and Climate for Change, uh, uh, I take this uh, conference to a conclusion. And the last panel discussion, I invite all the all the speakers to find a new themselves and also uh, have their cameras on so that we can take some questions uh, for the for the for the. Uh, I think because we have posted quite a lot of questions here. Shan, can I invite you on the, on the screen? Oh, Mr. Sandeep Bhattacharya. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have very, very, I mean, we have too many questions here. Uh, Floating around. Uh, some key questions. I think uh, we are having some uh, 20 minutes in the task. So we will take quickly. The first question was taking that the current announcement of the current announcement of the government of India diluting the environmental impact assessment. But we are talking about the sustainable development goals and the aim for meeting sustainable development goals 2030. Uh, views from the panelists. Uh, should I repeat the question? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Was that uh, the environmental impact assessment and management plan was there earlier, EIA EMP 2006, but later on now recently it is changed only to EIA 2020 and it is diluted. But as a panel and as an expert, as the experts, we are talking about. Uh, sustainable Development Goals 2030 that that every country need to meet. So, what are what are the views from the panelists? Anybody? Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, let's look at the issue from the perspective of the politicians, uh, especially when we are facing such difficult situations and the economy uh, is facing such difficult situations so uh, there is some pressure to let e let economic activity happen and s let some of the safeguards go i'm not saying i'm for it uh, hopefully the calculations of what the damage will be has been done and trade offs uh, been thought about you know there's there's a there's a trade off to every action and I also hope that the act, that particular action is temporary and will be rolled back uh, when better times come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in, in this continuation, there is another question that was directed towards Ms. Shan Lalwani. Uh, it was asked that existing sewage plants do not have any technique uh, treatment scheme for phosphate removal. Central Pollution Control Board recently came up with the new standards defining the phosphate standards. Your comments, please. You are on mute, Sean. I think we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it is okay. So uh, earlier, uh, the Indian Standard Code actually for laundry detergents used to say state that the minimum phosphate level would be 11% or 7% depending on whether the detergent is either grade 1 or grade 2. And recently they have brought this down to 2.5% of uh, phosphate. So they used sodium triphosphate in um, laundry detergents usually. The way forward is like most of the Western countries to completely eliminate phosphate and instead of a minimum requirement, have a maximum phosphate requirement in detergents. 
uh, although existing sewage treatment plants don't have a specific um, setup to remove the phosphates, there are certain processes yeah. in both um, aerobic and anaerobic plants that do remove certain phosphates and it's, they, they do take up a lot of energy, right? Like when we do certain flocculation and settling, etc. Um, I mean, the way forward also is we need to look at some more stringent standards across the world. We are a developing nation. And instead of developing the way the West did in an unsustainable manner, it is time for us to develop in a sustainable manner. We look at standards such as the European EcoSearch standard, which has zero phosphates, doesn't allow most petrochemical derivatives um, and uh, other items like that. And maybe instead of doing incremental changes, we can just have a very stringent standard implemented. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So moving to the next question, uh, I think uh, this is directed towards Commodore system. Uh, it's asking about uh, when do you expect the national material recycling policy in place? Uh, currently, due to COVID situation, it is even an urgency to implement this policy at the earliest. So any uh, any timelines or uh, do you ex do you see do you think that this will this policy will see the light of the day uh, soon sometime? Okay, uh, I think that's a good question. But uh, as we have uh, seen from the discussions that have taken place around the material recycling policy, uh, the original draft was prepared by Niti Aayog and circulated to all ministries. But later on, as Amar Singh will also uh, take on, what happened was this became a public document with the concerned ministries. And they all did a cut waste job of making their own steel policy and research policy and that was policy by taking extracts from the uh, natural material recycling policy. So uh, I still feel that a uh, harmonized, integrated, coordinated approach to material recycling is required. We can't have one, one recycling policy for tire, another one for tube, Another one for you know ballpoint pens, third one for plastic buckets, fifth one for iron or iron buckets. It is a cockeyed way to do things. We need a national material recycling policy, and and I think that recognition has to be uh, created. But uh, as we all know, government is you know consists of people, and all of them have different agendas and and, and have different uh, sort of uh, purposes behind it. To to be able to integrate the steel sector with the mining sector, the mining guys with the food processing fellows, the food processing chairs with the commerce and industry fellows, all of them with the Ministry of Finance. It's a huge haul. Ultimately, a decision like this has to be in the final run. The people of this country has to take that call. We can keep telling the government, do this, do that. We're getting nowhere. And uh, unless there's a sense of urgency that the people of this country uh, communicate to the government, that we need to do this, uh, so many jobs will get created, our, uh, our waters will become less polluted. Do you know how much of leachate is going into the uh, Ganga River every day because of uh, uh, illegal processing of uh, e-waste, e yeah. cyanide, yeah. acids? Many toxicants, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not some small amounts not in tons. So. Yeah. So I think this is something that the public has to uh, raise a question and hold our parliamentarians to account. If you go around in this bureaucratic way, you know, finance ministry ke suggestion le lete hain, environment all se puch lete hain, unse puch lete hain, to 25 saal nikal jayenge, we'll be still where we are. There is a policy document. It has been scrutinized by the respective uh, ministries. Now the cabinet has to take a call. The cabinet will only take a call if there is a public uh, pressure on the cabinet to pass these resolutions. And today is a good time to do this. We are seeing the impact of, of of the stupidity that humans do on our lives now. This whatever has happened is a creation of our own uh, sort of misfortune uh, 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 or whatever. It is it is our fault, and mm -hmm. we need to correct that. So I also want to take a minute on that environment impact assessment. I think uh, on the EIA, my view on that is. Uh, Giving too much discretion to government is uh, not such a great thing. But ultimately, it might be a good idea to relax this and relax that. But we find that uh, that in uh, that people always find some 
you know, strange way to exploit it. So whilst the policy might be nice and good and this is what is done, etc. But there'll be so many people who misuse it. And leaving it to discretion is very, very tough. On the other hand, asking for a huge amount of regimentation is also a stupid thing. Let me give you an example. There was one hydroelectric power plant which had to be come up, come up in some uh, northern West Bengal or something. It's an old case. Now, it's a hydroelectric power plant. It's not in the middle of the city. It's in some remote area. Now, to make that hydroelectric power plant, you need to take cement there. You need to take workers there. You need to take a moving machinery there. Now, this can't be airdropped. So, somebody had to make a road to go from A to B. Now, this required uh, to go through some forest land, etc. And obviously, trees had to be cut. The people said, no, no, no. You have got approval for making this hydroelectric power plant. We don't know about your road to get there and we are not giving you permission to do it. So ultimately, the answer was that, that you cut the trees and you pay the penalty and we'll go ahead with it. A much better solution can be done. So, you know, you could have converted that into a uh, lovely project where we bring in all this. So the poor guy actually cut the trees, paid the penalty for cutting the trees, which, which was not necessary to be done or whatever. He could have done it a much better way. Planted some other trees, didn't plant it since he paid the penalty. Activity is business. So, uh, so I think the environment impact assessment requires a lot more public um, intervention. And uh, unfortunately, in India, we have just so many thousands of problems that one more problem is, you know, put on some, type, some side table and uh, occasionally we refer back to it. I'm sorry, these are my two limited interventions. I, I have no idea when the uh, National Material Recycling Policy will be uh, will be announced. I think it's an absolutely urgent necessity for our country for creating livelihoods, for protecting our environment, bringing in technology and all this nonsense that is going on with uh, e-waste recycling and automotive recycling. It's a disaster. And with the new uh, laws that will come, we find, I showed you the screen shot of all these cars. Those photographs have been taken by me personally on those areas. So we need these policies and guidance so that industry comes forward and starts uh, uh, working towards uh, creating sustainable business models as uh, other people on this panel also said so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we also see a question, uh, I think it's related to you. When, we, when do we expect the automotive recycling policy to be announced? As, uh, as my colleague uh, Amar Singh would know, that we uh, actually the automotive recycling policy was a work uh, prepared by, uh, by the MRAI. And I think it was the first policy on recycling, which was not narrowly focused on one issue. It looked at everything. It looked at society, it looked at taxation, it looked at uh, uh, regulations, compliances, livelihood, skills, uh, certifications, how the whole process would be done. It was a full, uh, complete bundled package. This was submitted somewhere in October or September last year. Comments were sought by October. And then we were assured that you know, everything is fine. They did some consultations, everybody else. And it was supposed to do some other things. And we are now still here in almost next September, and we can't have an automotive recycling policy. I mean, this is really strange. It's not that much difficult. Automotive recycling, what is it? That we need, need to do some PhD on it. It's not required. It's a very simple document that requires. You know, I say, you take your car, you recycle it. You take your certificate, take it out of there. You have to do so much. So, for this, the people are now in the country, what do they do? It's amazing. <laughs> and every 15 days, we uh, get a news from Ministry of Road, Transport and Highway that this policy will come very soon. But that 15 days are not getting over any time. So, uh, and, uh, and also, at the end of it, uh, who's losing? All of us are losing, the government is also losing. Exactly. A lot of revenues out of it. You know, there's GST yeah. collection can go up, that whole material comes back into society. All these ISOs that we see in roads, RWS have gotten up to cars parked there from some fancy years when nobody knows what to do with it. All this has to stop and all that resource can come back into the economy. So what is the problem So taking to the next question, yeah, I think this discussion is uh, uh, very important. I think we somebody need to follow up with the ministries that okay, you take out, take out, do it fast, little bit probably. That's 
best requirement. I think in an association, they can do very well. Uh, so next question, I think it's directed to Mr. Sandeep Patacharya. Is he here? I think he's not here on the dais. But the question is that are green bonds launched in India, Indian market, launched in Indian market or only overseas? So it is launched in Indian market. It is being adopted by some of the companies. Uh, that's a reply. So when do you, uh, okay. Uh, there is another question. I, I think it's talking about status of the precious metal recovery in India. I think it's uh, directed towards Mr. Amar Singh. Uh, what is the status of precious metal recovery in India? And uh, if the if the ratio is less, then what are the hurdles in the precious metal recovery? See, the biggest, uh, the ratio is obviously very less as uh, you are also a part of e-waste management team. You know it very well. And the biggest hurdle is unorganized market. I will not say informal sector, but unorganized market. Whatever e-waste is being generated in India mostly is dumped into unorganized market. The only reason is there are so many compliances. There are so many compliances in uh, on the organized player that they are not able to or they are not perform. They are not able to perform the compliances and reg regulations. And they are not getting the break even also. So this is the reason the uh, precious metal are moving in an organized market and uh, the recovery is very, very less. Okay. Okay. So compliance with the Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we take it uh, as far. Uh, we are having one more question. I think this is directed towards Mr. Sujay Panel. Uh, it's it's asking that will Indian will India be able to uh, meet sustainable development goals 2030 on ground? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, <laughs> I can't uh, say much actually about it. But I mean, we can always. Your voice is quite low. We are a little here. Uh, is it any better? Hello. Yeah, it's better. Uh, I'm saying that we we all all uh, are seeing uh, and uh, as already uh, promoters Sujit Samadhar Sahab put it, uh, see the policies are there and uh, we largely have policies. To what extent is being followed is what is more important. The yeah. other thing is that uh, it is my personal opinion and you people are absolutely free to disagree with me. But the uh, the goals, the SDG goals that have actually been decided at a global level and uh, even for India and other countries, I do think it is uh, a bit more optimistic. It is a bit more uh, ambitious, I would say. But nevertheless, uh, India is doing good so far, and uh, let us hope by the thing by the time 2030 comes, things might actually you know we might be able to achieve it. So let's be hopeful about that. Thank you. And I think we will take this last question before closing it. Uh, the question is asking about what is the view of the panelists? Uh, key skills that are needed for enabling the transition of the linear economy to circular economy. Uh, the question is uh, there that it's asking the what are the views of the panelists? about the skills that are needed to for enabling transition from linear to circular economy. What is the skill set that is required for? Okay, uh, I think that skill set would be a long laundry list uh, that maybe uh, get might get washed with some uh, good detergent that uh, Ms. Lalwani's company <laughs> makes at the moment. But at the moment, uh, where we are looking at is skill sets, and if you just want to segregate it in different, first is, of course, technology. And we are not looking at all people with PhDs and all that in engineering, that sort of thing. But we are all looking at a whole lot of skill sets in understanding and identifying metals, for example, in understanding and identifying different types of plastics, for example. This doesn't require you to have some, uh, you know, uh, master's degree in technology. But these are things, these are the sort of skills which are there in our scrap uh, pickers, but they can be honed so that they get better value from the collections that they make. Because for them, all plastics are same. 
the moment you mix up all plastics the recovery rates become less your realization order that plastic becomes less so if he can segregate it correctly he now knows pet bottle usko sab pata hai pet bottle le lo usme mere ko 14 rupees mil jayenge but uh, but yeah. uh, all the other waste that are coming out in plastics if he segregates it properly also his realization will be higher because the uh, because the technology is for processing each type of plastic waste is different Uh, mm-hmm. that is at that lower level secondly is uh, is from a industry point of view it's very difficult to set up these plants unless they have uh, all three in it i mean there must be a product there must be by products and there must be co products so that there is every element of that whole process contributes back to some resource so we cannot let the steam be let off if the steam if it's a steam generated stuff then that steam should drive a turbine and the turbine to do something else if you got um, biochemicals out of that then it must go through some processes to convert it into pesticides or uh, or fertilizers or whatever xyz that comes out of it so like that you know so those sort of skills of integration is very required thirdly i think which is very important is to be able to develop the correct financials behind it and that financial modeling of understanding how uh, how recycling industries can be uh, uh, can be uh, you know Power source for uh, revenues and make an attractive, sustainable business case. Those financial modeling techniques need to be understood. Then, lastly, of course, there's a whole lot of legal issues that we need to be compliant with, and I think that's a skill set we don't have. There are not many people who are looking at, uh, at the legal issues on recycling, not only from a narrow environmental point of view, but also from inclusivity of the social strata in our country, of the kind of roads that we build. of the kind of uh, 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 electricity generation we make how what kind of foods we make including uh, what kind of laundry uh, detergents that we make you know all these things there has to be some skills which are required for all of that and it's a huge skill set all of this skill set is not going to come to us from colleges we probably need more vocational training more ngos to get engaged in uh, in uh, bringing up these skill sets in our in the bottom part of our uh, Uh, systems and that, that's how we we'll look at it the example about solid waste municipal waste i think uh, uh, mr bhattacharya spoke about that but even in municipal waste there are so many different types of municipal waste the ability to segregate yeah. municipal waste to, uh, to to utilization is different bio waste is different forest waste is different all of that should be done yeah. and uh, i remember this wonderful person who came in niti ayog he was a german guy mm-hmm. and he was uh, mm-hmm. converting forest waste which was giving jobs to tribal people from from these which had fallen through into replacing this shaadi ke occasion mein wo kaun sa thermocol ka jo plastic ka plate banta hai uske jagah mein he was having this beautiful product made out of processed mm-hmm. leaves a german guy i don't know what happened to him at the end of it but i was very impressed with what he did it was a consolidated project which looked after tribal women it created local job opportunities and it got rid of the stupid thermocol which is which goes into shaadi on all these other gatherings so there are lots of skills that we can look at it yeah over to you mr sujay banerjee um a very nice yeah. point is am i audible now am i audible yeah. even uh, yeah very nice points uh, put forth by commodore uh, samadhar but uh, i think that even before we uh, start discussing the skill sets of people we drastically your voice is little bit low your voice is little bit low uh, okay okay let me try let me try and increase uh, uh, uh this speak just better. hold the mic uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. hold the mic so i'm saying that like, that even before we you know come to the issue of skill sets i think the country drastically needs a change of mindset of people or should i say they need to be and non biodegradable degradable that is the very basic thing no yeah. we are still chucking our batteries like you know these the batteries that we are using they are still chucking our batteries into the waste and we do not know what happens i mean most people do not know what happens when it like you know gets into a landfill or it it goes into any kind of water body and and i i mean believe me people don't even know this the people don't even they are not bothered but like you know we are doing great great damage to the generations that are going to come and i do think that uh, there is a strong need for education of the masses through like you know broadcast media maybe television and uh, radios and things like that so people are more aware they at least know that if we throw a battery into a garbage what is the outcome of it thank you 
So any any point, Shan? So, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, at, even at the city level, at least we have resources. Even if a person throws, a, a, let's say they throw an aluminium can in their garbage, a rag picker is going to come and pick it up and take it away and have some value for that. So I have two points, uh, maybe. One is at the rural level, we there is absolutely no waste management. If you go to any village in India, the waste management is the stream. So all their plastic, all their solid waste, everything is put into the stream and it eventually leads into the ocean. So, you know, when we think about waste, we're always thinking about the city, but there are always resources within the urban environment. And I've visited multiple waste management sites um, in my area to uh, do that and interacted with the waste pickers and there's always something there. There's nothing at the rural level. Secondly, um, on a policy level, I feel that maybe we should be looking to tax virgin materials, uh, where virgin materials become a lot more expensive, and that will incentivize the use of recycled materials. So, for example, steel gets recycled because the virgin steel and recycled steel are almost at the same price right when you're going to sell it so there is a lot of value recovery from that now if we tax virgin materials where they become almost unaffordable such as plastic right if we start taxing virgin plastic then there is opportunity to uh, see because recycled plastic is very expensive first the collection is difficult especially when you look at little things like uh, milk packets and wrappers and stuff like that they're very difficult to collect um, and sort and recycle, which we've already covered. Now, if we can make that more affordable compared to a virgin material, then there is perhaps something we can do on a policy level over there. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Yes, Sujo. Yeah. Uh, one very small point to add. I mean, this is not uh, anything uh, like pioneer or any, this is not. You have to bring the mic closer to you. Uh, like if this is practiced in some countries. So, for example, if a water bottle is selling at 15 rupees, what they do is they, they price it at 20 rupees. And if you return the water bottle, then you, you get 5 rupees back. Yeah. Now, the person is like, you know, mentally paying 20 rupees, but he knows if I pay back, I, I, if I pay, you bring back the bottle, I get 5 rupees. So, I mean, these kind of things are very good initiatives for getting all the waste back and especially for recycling. Thank you. Also, Thank I, you so I much. Could also add this little two interesting points. You know, this we yeah. discussed this whole business about waste segregation at great length. You know, we must have your local colored bins for this, blue colored for that, green color for that. In all those discussions, I used to only ask them one question. For 70 years, we had three lights in our life: a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. ये सत्तर साल में हमको अभी तक समझ में नहीं आया कि red light के मतलब stop है, yellow के मतलब रुक जाओ, green में we haven't understood that. Yeah. Now you want to complicate it further with more colors, blue for this, green for that, not happening. So, but in all these situations, uh, where the uh, where we have to learn to use uh, is get technology. Because we can't change human nature in, in one day. We can't change people who are going to you know trash the way that they want to trash the way. I remember in Japan, mm -hmm. I had to put my uh, uh, whiskey bottle as the bottle, the cap separately, and it, if they couldn't be put together, the cap went into a separate bin and, and that was it. Everybody did it. I also did it. But here in this case, we are not going to get to that level of segregation, no matter. I also have this guy who's going around search Bharat, etc. Some jingle has been made for it and all very nice, attractive, but it's not happening because that in that whole thing, everything is all bundled up. This is where technology has to come. Our businessmen and our entrepreneurs have to think of integrated plants, which are able to hand handle mixed waste. That means you have eddy current separators, you have magnetic separators, you have gravity separators, you have air separators. No matter what you put into it, my waste plant will make sure that I get uh, ferrous here, aluminum here, paper here, plastic wraps there, mud here, whatever. I can do it. It's it's elementary to do this job. Then I'm not stuck in this whole game that you do it or do it here. No you give it to me. I will put uh, bio waste here. I'll put uh, metal waste here. I can put paper here. They're all technologically feasible today. 
So, but that requires uh, uh, some entrepreneurship and obviously a public-private partnership. Nobody can do it on his own. One very interesting suggestion which had come to us from uh, one of our special secretaries work in Niti Ayo was kitchen waste. Today, kitchen waste is is a nuisance for you. But suppose I, I put this model upside down. I said, I will buy kitchen waste. Now you see, every housewife is going to make sure that that kitchen wife is sold to you. Now I'm paying 30 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever X rupees to take charge of my uh, kitchen waste and that gets lost for knows where. But if I get very good quality kitchen waste, then my waste to energy function, biomethanation, all that, uh, whatever else this uh, fertilizers and whatever else, uh, what is it called? I compost. Word for it, huh? Sorry? Compost. Uh, compost. Compost. You know, then all this becomes business sense to me because I'm getting pure waste. I pay the housewife two rupees a kilo or whatever X number, but it now becomes a resource. I don't throw away cardboard. I don't throw away newspaper because I know that Kabadi Hala will pay me five bucks. Here. But I throw, I'm quite happy to throw away, you know, kitchen waste and whatever other waste because nobody's paying me for it. Moment I start paying for it, I can convert it into waste to energy, composting, biomethanation, 150 things because it's clean waste, clean yeah. kitchen waste or bio waste, yeah, yeah. which can come from right. forests or from uh, municipal parks or wherever. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and people will happily uh, make it as a separate clean waste to give it, clean kitchen waste to give it. Yeah. yeah and right. uh, in Tokyo, I used, uh, I used to exchange my uh, newspapers to get toilet rolls. I mean, it was a state for a transaction. There's no intervening <laughs> period. Uh, 30th of the month, it comes and collects my uh, newspapers. He gives me whatever, eight, eight uh, packs or whatever. I've forgotten how much. Or toilet rolls. See that transaction. Zero complication. That's it done. All all paper. Just have to make sure that the damn thing was uh, was uh, stored in the right place. It was not not ruined. It's a simple thing. Yeah. Both of us benefited. I didn't have to lug around hundred pieces with toilet rolls. The bulky things to carry anyway. So if it comes to you at home, it's a good thing. <laughs> oh yeah. I think I think wonderful insights and wonderful inputs. So many. We have exceeded. Though we exceeded the time, we couldn't really realize that we are we are exceeding the time. And uh, with this, I think uh, we will uh, conclude this two days web conference on circular economy and SDGs, strategy 2020-2030, a decade of action, of course. So let us take this a decade of action, a real time action, um, collaborate, join together and do something that can really contribute to sustainable development goals 2030, but far more making the change in the lives on the ground and in our surroundings. I think that will make, a, uh, make more sense for everybody. And uh, with this, I would like to thank all the panelists and all the speakers for coming all the way and giving their precious time to us, staying with us for now. It's like uh, more than two hours, two and a half hours. We are here with us together. And all the participants for taking out their time and joining us for this event. Uh, please continue collaboration. Keep writing to us. We would be happy to join you in any of your initiatives you would like to take on circular economy, sustainable development goals, and uh, you need any kind of uh, guidance. So let us collaborate. Our email IDs are given very well on the Institute's website also. Keep in touch. Let us make sustainable development goal, 20, uh, goal number 17 a realized one on the ground. Thank you so much for coming all the way. Uh, thank you, Commodore Sujit Samadar. Thank you, Shan. Thank you, Mr. Sujay Banerjee, for being with us. And uh, I think Sandeep and uh, uh, other speakers are not here with us. Thanks, all the speakers, for being with us. Thank you all. Have a nice day and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Nice meeting all of you. Bye bye.